Okay, I think we're going to get started then. Um, you're all fully caffeinated and we're ready to go for our last talk, our closing keynote address. After Dr. Wilder speaks, um, she and the two other panelists and myself are going to move over to the table immediately following her talk. And then we'll begin having a group conversation. Um, Dr. Kelly Wilder is director of the Photographic History Research Center at De Montfort University in Leicester, UK. In her work, Dr. Wilder frequently considers the photographic practices of 19th century scientists and artists like William Henry Fox Talbot, Sir John Herschel, Henri Becquerel, and others. Additionally, Kelly considers the material and cultural histories of science and photography, where they intersect at points in the 19th and 20th centuries in research, image making, and industry. From 2000 to 2003, she worked as assistant editor to the Talbot Correspondence at the University of Glasgow, and in 2004 as the co-editor of Roger Fenton's Crimean Letter Books. From 2005 to 2008, she was a fellow at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science before joining De Montfort University as a senior research fellow. Among her many and varied publications, she is the author of the book Photography and Science, published by Reaction in 2009. Kelly's chapter titled Locating the Photographic Archive of Science um, appeared in a 2011 volume called Photo Archives and the Photographic Memory of Art History, edited by Costanza Carafa, and it came out as part of an earlier Photo Archives conference. She is co-author of a book titled Documenting the World, Film, Photography, and the Scientific Record, which is almost hot off the press. I'm sure you can go onto Amazon now and pre-order, right, Kelly? From the University of Chicago Press in 2016. So get your pre-orders in now. <laughs> get her rankings up. Today, she will be giving this conference's closing keynote address in a paper entitled The View from Everywhere, Objectivity and the Photographic Archive. Kelly. Thank you very much for the book plug and the um, introduction. Two of the authors in that book are sitting in the audience, Stephanie Klam and Jennifer Tucker. Um, so I'm sure they're happy also to hear that it's nearly hot off the presses. It's been a long time coming. I think um, instead of thanking um, the organizers, I'd really like everyone to give them a round of applause now before we get too far into this. This has been a fantastic conference, and I think to bring together such a diverse group of people um, who can talk across disciplines, who can talk across institutions, who can bring several kinds of institution together is a truly exceptional achievement. And it's something that only exceptional individuals can pull off. And we're very, very grateful for the reception we've had at um, both institutions and that many of us have had in Florence as well. So thank you. Um, Today I'm going to talk about the view from everywhere, which um, is not in black and white, uh, as I've put it here. And the reason why I want to do this is I'm, I want to try to get back to the notion of objectivity in the face of perhaps one of the most influential books written lately, which is the book Objectivity by Rainey Dastin and Peter Gallison. And I think the notion of objectivity has really um, become a talking point. It, it was beforehand, but it now has become a very present talking point for those of us who use images. Um, and so I've written this paper a little bit with that in mind, and uh, just so that you understand the background of it. In 1986, to take you back a bit, uh, Thomas Nagel wrote a book, The View from Nowhere, uh, which in philosophy, in philosophical circles, has become one of the great bestsellers in the philosophy of mind. Um, it introduced readers to these two areas. On the one hand, you had this featureless, centerless landscape of the physical conception of objectivity, the stuff out there. And on the other hand, you have this personal and very and highly subjective world um, of mental objectivity in here. Um, so the public and the private, again, to bring up this theme that has been going on through most of the papers that we've talked about. Um, 
Since that book, this conception of the view from nowhere has really been a touchstone for arguments that think about the mind, and the mind especially in its relationship with the world. And I think that's really what we're talking about when we're trying to understand what, the relate, what objectivity is and how we relate in some way to what we find in the archives and how the things in those archives make us tell the stories about what's out there in the real world. Um, it's been used as a kind of verbal shorthand, the view from nowhere. Um, this unachievable ideal of objectivity, that is, observations made entirely outside of personal histories, opinions, practices. Um, playing on this imagined space, I want to actually introduce the idea of perhaps its virtual and physical opposite. The view from everywhere. So the view from everywhere is a landscape that proliferates with features. Um, it's full of points of view. It's one where the mental image is actually formed and modified by the physical landscape, which is in turn viewed through the lens of the mental image. Um, and it, this forms a kind of funny place, a really curious place where no firm division of, uh, between the self and the world can actually occur. The view from everywhere is simply speaking the photographic archive. It might sound really dramatic, actually, folding the self into the archive like this, although some of us who work in archives a lot feel very often like you have become part of the archive, or as Marnie said, um, one of those objects that needs to be studied uh, sometime by someone in the future. But I think there's some method in my madness in attempting to do this, and in the short time, I want to explore three parts of what I see as the view from everywhere. Now, I'm not saying this is the entire thing, um, but these are sort of thinking pieces, I think, for putting together what we might conceive of how photographic archives pretend to function. Um, so the first is this role of subjectivity in establishing objectivity, so not um, a polar opposite, but in actual fact how they work together. Uh, the second is the photographic manufacture of objects of study. Um, and the third is the way in which photographic practices are implicated in archival practices, how they become part of the archival practices that we um, then take forward. So in the, in the first part of the talk, I'm going to explore this endless unfolding of the public and the private, and um, the objective and the subjective in photographic archives and the reproduction of those archives. In the second part, I'm going to introduce the idea of photographic copying of photographs, um, especially in sales catalogs, and in online repositories as a way um, uh, that photography has of actually making objects of study appear and sometimes disappear, as Marnie has um, so excellently shown us. Last, I'm going to take up photographic catalogs and cataloging, which is a theme that I've been talking about for some time. So it'll be the shortest section, because some of you have already heard it, and I don't want to bore you to tears um, uh, as I have in the past. So that's where photographs have actually insinuated themselves into the practices and the archival protocols that we have. That is, our archives are being controlled in some way by photographic practices. Um, <clears throat> and all these examples have in common that liminal thing that's called a photograph, or that we call a photograph. I can say a photograph, but in actual fact, we have no idea what a photograph is. Um, if it, it's a bit like Wittgenstein's uh, language problem of what is a game. So now, if I say, we're going to go play a game, we all understand what a game is. However, we all have a different notion of a game in mind. You might think twister, and I might think solitaire. Uh, two, those two things are actually very, very different. Um, so this photograph and the production of the ever-increasing numbers of them is, of course, much on my mind, as it is on everyone's mind in the room. And one of my main objectives in the talk is to understand a photograph as in fact a group of things. Um, it's not one thing, and they never come in singles. This has been one of the fatal flaws in studying photography and in theorizing photography since the 1970s, is the idea that a photograph is in any way singular. Um, so it's a negative, a positive, a print, a lantern slide. It's a face cut out and stuck onto um, perhaps something from the Illustrated London News. It's a halftone. It's a digital master. And it's any other number of material incarnations um, that in their own way are individually unique, but they are in some way connected. Uh, and when you move one, very often the others move too. Not all the time, but very often. Um, and so they remain linked in some kind of strange way. Um, so this paper takes the idea of the photograph with all its aspirational totality, that is, 
the everythingness about it. Robin Kelsey very beautifully termed this the abundance of photography, and I think he's very right. I, I love this term. Um, and in creating, to, and I'm going to use those to interrogate what, what archives do in the world, what photographs do in the world, and how, um, we're, how we are affected by the mythical view um, from everywhere that they appear to produce. So first we need to explain what the view from nowhere might be. Where's my point? Um, this is um, the, this sort of photographic objectivity that I think we've heard so much about that is so often discussed in the 19th century that um, Dasson and Gallison have so very clearly explicated in their book. Um, in the, I'm gonna start with the private and the public. So in his own words, Nagel's book is about one single problem. And actually, I think it's a problem that very much sums up what the photographic archive is about. How to combine the perspective of a particular person in, who's inside the world with an objective view of that same world. Um, and the objective view of the same world has to also incorporate the personal view of that person. Um, so uh, that, that viewpoint, her viewpoint, I'm, I'm gonna change um, his, uh, his pronoun. I'm sure he won't mind. Um, we've updated in the last couple of decades. Um, so it's this personal viewpoint, what I wanna call the private, and it's enclosure within the objective view of that same world, um, let's call that the public, where I think photographic archives are often get invested or where the notion of objectivity gets inserted. So once you step outside of the personal view and you start thinking about um, uh, the bigger view, incorporating many personal views. Um, Nagel says, well, in that way, we can sort of see many views, and that is a form of objectivity. And he says, every time you do that, you are um, achieving yet more objectivity, or another step away from the subjectivity that is one particular view. Um, so every time you move outwards in that, you kind of establish more um, objectivity. So I want to use a demonstration of this, because it's, it's, I was reading a lot about it, and I'm not a philosopher, um, and I was thinking, well, this is a little bit hard to conceive of. So there's a group of photographs that will help me argue the point visually. So just as I was beginning to write this paper, um, a friend of mine, uh, Lala Meredithula, was asked to um, dig through her archive in order to make an exhibition. Now, this is not an uncommon thing for photographers to be asked to do, but the exception is that this is no ordinary exercise in digging through a personal archive. So here's her archive in her darkroom, as many photographers' archives look like this. Her boxes happen to be Ilford, but sometimes they're red boxes for Agfa or yellow boxes for Kodak. We're very used to the way photographers' archives look. Um, the particular archive they wanted, though, consisted of images she made in 1990 and 1991 of the blood feud reconciliations that took place in Kosovo. So at that time, 1990, 1991, Lala, who was a student at Goldsmiths in London, um, was on a Yugoslav scholarship to Pristina University. She's half Albanian, living in London. Um, she set out to explore these reconciliation events um, in a very personal way. So you might even say that she was exploring her own past and heritage, although she says that at Goldsmiths at the time, they were very encouraged to explore anything personal that they encountered in great detail. And that was how she approached this project. Now, I say this as if um, she was entirely uh, responsible, but in actual fact, the location of her physical being at Pristina University was a catalyst to her being able or even hearing about these events. So. Um, I'll just give you, a, in case you don't know about the blood feud reconciliations, uh, it's, it was a very important event since the 15th century uh, in Albanian culture. Um, it is uh, law that uh, a killing was avenged with another killing, and, and this uh, had, had spiraled up until the advent of communism into families being pr eternally at war with one another because one these uh, debts were inherited over the generations, and it did get to the point where people had to disappear entirely um, from public life. Uh, under communism, uh, this was not allowed, and, uh, but as soon as the communist regime was lifted in Kosovo, Macedonia, other places, the blood feud reconciliations also began again. However, many of the students who ended up at Pristina University and other places had been uh, political prisoners 
uh, under communism and had often shared cells with other families with whom they had blood, feud, uh, blood feuds going on. And they had decided they'd wasted enough of their lives and that really this was something that needed, something needed to be done. And uh, a movement was started, there are many people involved, you can read all about it, about um, having these blood feuds publicly reconciled, publicly forgiven. The only way to do this was to bring the families together to ha and have them publicly witnessed by the community um, uh, where the debt was in fact forgiven. Now, this required a lot of um, organization, and it also required staying out of the way of the police and the security forces who were not in favor of these events uh, going on. Some of them took place when they were not so unfavorable, and some of them were then later, it was a process that was clamped down on for various reasons. I won't go into it now. Um, so in it, you can see that Lala, even in an image like this, now she's half Albanian, she speaks Albanian, she is in fact part of this community and knew people there and the only reason, many, much of the reason she got out with so much footage is because she was taken in by families, she was hidden from the authorities um, so that she could bring her film back. Many people went and photographed and documented what was going on but not many people got out with their film. Um, she actually was there and is acknowledged as you can see in this image as being within the process. And people in the images acknowledge her presence very often and speak to her and uh, the images show that her personal viewpoint is quite important. Um, so she made very personal private images of a very public event um, and then they went into her private archive. Um, and you can see it here, it says, Yugo, 1987, right there in the middle, in among, and, and some of these uh, boxes farther down, but it's in among uh, some of her other work on bats and um, uh, shifting borders, and um, I don't want to know what's in a bum box, but um, uh, anyway, the, this is, they were then hung, and she was asked to hang them in a show called Blood Memory at the National Gallery of Kosovo in 2015. Now, this process is extremely politically informed. I mean, it's politically motivated and politically informed. So that is in the background of all of this. So when they were displayed, they became part of, um, and here is another one, a very public sort of, oh, I'm missing one. Uh, when they were displayed, they became part of a very sort of public form of identity construction of the Albanian community. Um, so far, so objective. Uh, the images are going to go into the National Archive. They're serving both as an art collection and as a historical record of a series of events that are critical to Albanian identity. And she and I have had lots of long talks about what it's like to have your personal archive mined for, for a national historical event suddenly. And um, it was a very interesting series of discussions that she and I have had about how that feels and what you think about, um, what, how, what kind of images people pluck out of your personal archive in order to represent a kind of national historical event. Um, but that's an, for another talk. Um, in the exhibition, the photographs took on a very interesting sort of agency. They encouraged and, in fact, um, seemed to induce a reenactment of the performance of forgiveness. And um, for this, I, I owe a lot of my thinking to Elizabeth Edwards' work on, on performativity and performance with photographs. Uh, people talk over photographs. Photographs make us do things. They are not passive agents. They are not just sources to be mined for information. In actual fact, what happens most when you hand someone a photograph is they start talking. Um, and this is one of the wonderful things about photographs, uh, is that we are very, very connected to uh, what photographs are. And I'm really glad that Marnie brought up empathy and sympathy, because I think we don't talk about them enough as historians, especially of very affective things like photographs. Um, again, we can discuss that more when we have a little bit more time. So people photograph themselves with and in front of uh, these photographs. And they folded together not only this past event with a present one, but they also flattened the sort of layers of Lala's private photography with this very public memory of a public institution having a public exhibition, um, and moved the two back into the private sphere of self-representation and probably of uh, sharing on a digital platform with other friends and family. And what's really interesting, um, I've sort of taken a very broad theme on the idea of reproduction of uh, works of art, which is that the personal reproduction of people enacting things in front of photographs. And here you see, it's, it's quite interesting actually, here you see the, um, 
uh, president of Bulgaria reenacting to the president of Kosovo the, the Reconciliation Act. And as you can see, they're watched by the, the photographic crowd, and they are indeed photographed by the photograph reenacting the event, which is in turn photographed by Lala, the original photographer. Um, so this is not a, a simple view of objectivity, because what we have here is an enfolded idea of layers and layers of subjectivity. And it was, um, listening to Glenn's talk yesterday was, was fantastic, because it's about the many layers of subjectivity and its interaction with how one makes objectivity out of those subjectivities that in fact seem to be very important in the photographic archive. And indeed in the view of anything that might, we might think about as being history. Um, so they don't want to stay put, these photographs, as usual. I love photographs because they never stay put and it would be very dull if they did. Um, and I think that's also part of the problem of thinking about objectivity as being a fixed object, um, because it's a moving target. Uh, it's, it's a moving target according to the philosophers who have been very clear on this for a very long time. Um, but it's also a moving target about people like Dustin and Gallison who've written about objectivity, who understand that actually objectivity is a socially and, a socially and culturally constructed idea. Uh, it has not been with us forever, and the same type of objectivity will not be with us forever. And I think our archives notion of preserving something as it in, in ice uh, and never moving it, never allowing it to move. Um, you know, the deep cold storage in, in the Iron Mountain facility is my worst nightmare of, a, of something being stuck in a format forever that will never move. I mean, it, it, actually, it actually halts something that in fact should be changing at all times um, in order for us to, be, to have it constitute history. Um, so, um, so these, these photographs, in actual fact, gain currency um, by reconnecting, reconnecting with these subjective acts that pe of people returning them to their own private archives, um, making themselves, uh, in fact, players within the photographs. And better yet, they, they actually are added to by being shared um, with a broader audience. In fact, indexicality is not enough. Um, it is not enough to explain why we use photographs for his history. Indexicality might be a small part of where people start, but in fact it doesn't explain what we do with them. They remain powerful only as long as they continue to have that kind of agency, that kind of movement, and that, that mobility that mo allows them to become subjective again in order for us to think of them as objective. Um, so they induce us to repurpose them and then the photographs react to the repurposing. Um, it's clear that, that in here, it's not a negative relationship between objectivity and subjectivity. It's not a combative relationship. And Nagel is very clear about that in uh, The View from Nowhere, which is something that I've really taken from reading it. It's such an old text that's been around, but ph philosophy is so siloized, um, it hasn't really made its way outward in the way that some other theorists perhaps have. Um, so, I, and I saw this um, uh, in, when Glenn was showing us the, um, Jan van der Mullen's this obsessive photography of Chart, and it, began, it made me think about the notion of hope also. It's a kind of aspirational activity. I hadn't thought about that before yesterday, but now I've kind of added this in, although I have no idea what to make of that now. Um, but we can talk about that, because I was, I've been thinking about it since you spoke yesterday, and I'm not sure what I make of it, but I think there is something about aspiration, the aspiration of attempting to scoop up the whole world, as we've talked about in Documenting the World, the aspiration of total, total knowledge, of complete knowledge, um, or any knowledge at all, for that matter. Uh, just to lower the bar slightly. Um, photography encourages this view from everywhere as a method for overcoming subjectivity. Um, and that has been a, a sort of topic, topic of conversation since it was invented. Um, and it lies behind a lot of the photographic campaigns made with photography and film. Um, so that's one part of it, this objectivity-subjectivity relationship. But I'm running out of time and I've gone on far too long. So I'm very quickly going to go through the next two pieces, because I'm aware that I'm the only thing standing between you and a glass of wine. Um, and so I'm going to move on to part two, which is a very different set of photographs. Um, it's about how photographs make 
photographic objects. And in this, it has a lot to do with Marnie's talk about what, how we generate research questions from photographs. That is, photographs of things actually make us think about things to study. So they generate research objects. This has been um, a, a topic in the history of science for, for a decade or more about the creation of objects. Um, we may or may not think that these are objects before someone discovers them and starts talking about photographs of them. Um, but very much like um, uh, photographs of invisible things, photographs of visible things can make objects of study as well. Um, and most aestheticians, like Walton and Kendall and Scruton and all those guys, they concentrate on the making of photographs when they dispute the objective nature um, of them. They talk about cameras and wet plates and dry plates and gelatin and albumin and camera angles and composition and all that good stuff. Um, now, I don't want to deny that these are really important in the making of photographs, but actually photographic objects, the making of photographic objects is perhaps even more important. Um, and Frederica showed us this morning about how commercial, a, a commercial enterprise can make an object of study. That is, make a canon an object of study. Just merely by circulating a set of images and making them become the canon. So just like the canon comes into being and some of it goes out of being, names get changed, attributions get changed. Um, and my thinking on this is really very much indebted to Joan and, and Jennifer and uh, Elizabeth Edwards. Um, I want to think about photographic sales catalog. Ah, yes. We'll talk about this. So, and because actually, the, what made me think this is a line in Nagel, where he says actually objectivity is not even enough. So there are some things we can't even understand by thinking about them as becoming more objective. And I think the making of research topics is one of those. It is both subjective and objective at the same time, all the time. It doesn't help to think, well, maybe we could make a more objective research question, or maybe that we could um, uh, come up with something that is sufficiently distanced from our personal viewpoint that it would be real. So I'm always telling this to undergraduates, you know, you're not going to walk out and stumble over the truth. Photo photographs do not show you the truth. They show you whatever photographs show you. Um, and I think it's interesting because um, it's, it's nice to know that a maximally objective standpoint is not always a good thing. Um, and it's not always possible. And I don't think we should aspire to it at all times. So to photographic catalogs. Um, so, and, and this is actually in response to thinking about scooping up the whole world in photographs. So documenting by scooping up the whole world that is making comprehensive catalogs is very different from documenting by making objects of research. This is... Um, uh, this is a, cat, a sales catalog of lantern slides by Stewart, um, active in the 1860s, an instrument maker who in the 1860s and 70s and perhaps beyond was making lantern slides and lantern slide materials. Now, the making of these as objects to buy and or make into your slide lecture really controls how it is that we generate objects to talk about. Um, and those objects that we then talk about are constrained by either business constraints, what we think will sell, um, and this is some, nothing new. Um, Corpus is merely an extension of uh, what was going on in the 19th century, which was the idea that we could make um, people see an accepted view. Uh, um, and uh, this wonderful discussion about how all views of Palestine look the same. They're, it's as if people would walk along and stand and take only one view of particular monuments and only see that part of the city. And, and it's true that we have then um, invested heavily in having those particular things be an area of study. Um, so the company, interestingly, would uh, encourage people to see these views by actually sending out their catalogs for free, which is a good thing because um, if you'll see, it says illustrated catalog, new edition, 240 pages, just published, gratis. And the post was even free, which is no insignificant thing in Britain uh, in the 19th century. Um, but it's good because this is a very large and unwieldy object, as you can tell by my very bad photograph of it in the, in the archive in Bradford. Um, it, it's, it's enormous and it's heavy and they would send this out to prospective buyers and 
it seems that you would be able to keep it. Now this advertisement was actually a lantern slide that would be shown at the beginning of lantern slide shows so that people would know that where they could buy their supplies and um, uh, who they could get the illustrated catalog from. In this way where business actually sort of asks us to see legitimate points of view, as Frederica pointed out very, very well this morning, um, that can construct a certain notion of what you ought to go and study or you ought to see as um, something in particular. Um, you'll be thankful to know, Joan, I'm not gonna talk about the urns, for which I have a great fondness, I know. Um, and this goes also for an album in St. Andrews, which is not an album um, by Thomas Roger. It is an album of photographs by Thomas Roger, but it's not actually an album. It's a sales catalog. And what's interesting about this sales catalog is the images, um, both of art reproductions and of his compilations, micro photographs of the luminaries of Scotland, and um, I forget what the round one is. I think it's um, queens and ladies in waiting, to tell you the truth. Uh, these circulated around a particular area. They circulated within St. Andrews, and you find them repeated in the albums of St. Andrews um, notables in great quantity over and over again. And the um, digital catalog has enabled us to see how many copies there are actually in albums that were constructed by people who knew Thomas Roger, who was the local um, photographer, and who is really only known by his proximity to other more well-known photographers like Brewster, uh, I won't even mention the un Hill and Adamson. Um, and actually, Thomas Roger what, had much more influence. Uh, he circulated, and his images circulate in these circles, much more than either Hill and Adamson's did or, or Brewster's. And, um, uh, so, but he is completely unknown because he's the studio photographer of town. So he's not the artiste. Um, and Corbis does the same thing. It constructs the return on your search by an algorithm. Um, and that algorithm is also, um, is also has a business interest. So in actual fact, um, a lot of the photographs that are circulating um, have a very, um, are very steeped in the notion of business, the, the notion of commerce, the notion of profit. And they have been for a very, very long time, but we just haven't studied it. And I do think we need to pay more attention to how um, what we study has actually been influenced by the fact, by what cells, because that's what we have in our archives very often. Um, and I don't think it's new, although I think Corbis, I, it was funny that we also pick, we both pick on Corbis, it's just the one that springs to mind, and my, my knowledge of that uh, is really indebted to Estelle Blaschka's work. Um, very briefly, um, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, photographic catalogs because I think it's really important about how, um, in the last minute or two remaining, how photography, instead of scooping everything up, has actually become the process by which we catalog. And I think this is a kind of a view from everywhere that we need to be very aware of. Photography is not innocent. Um, photography has a set of practices. Those practices are always changing and you know, it's different depending on where you are. It is something that we do um, but photographs actually affect us in certain ways. And we have now built them into our catalogs in ways where they, um, they affect wh where you go. Um, the attractiveness, for instance, of uh, one photograph over another in attracting people to look at a particular collection. Um, we see this more and more as people um, uh, group things into collections. But the use of photographs actually is not new. Um, anyone who has been was in, has been in the Science Museum or in Bradford, for instance, um, might know these Form 100s. I'm sure lots and lots of archives had forms that look a lot like this, acquisition forms for particular objects. You will see that this one says Nice for Niaps, photo etched plate and print. It has all the metadata, and then underneath it, it has its nickname, the cardinal plate, um, and it has all sorts of information about where it went, last loan to the, or plate loan to the RPS, you know, et cetera, et cetera, um, back when it was at Russell Square. On, um, and it also says photograph number, 6490, 6491, 6492. Lantern slide, nothing. Postcard number, not there. So it hasn't been made into a postcard, thankfully. Um, uh, <laughs> it was not made into a lantern slide, at Bradford anyway. Um, um, but there have been several photographs made of it. Now, I don't have any photos of the intervening photographs, but actually one of the prints of one of the photographs made of it is on the back um, of this. So. Uh, and on the back of each of these Form 100 cards is a picture. Um, and what's interesting is it's not just one 
thing in the picture. So very often photographs do not correspond to the metadata that we give them. And that's been going on for a very long time. In actual fact, I don't know why we put these kinds of photographs in with our catalogs. Very often they have n bear no resemblance whatsoever to the thing that's being cataloged. And you're not sure whether, um, I mean, I know now, because of the notions of access to a more general public, very often, for instance, you get positives um, when the actual item in the collection is a negative. Uh, this is, to me, a quite a confusing thing. I'm sure to lots of people it doesn't cause them any pain whatsoever, but I always look at it and think, which one is wrong? Because one of them is wrong. It's not a positive image and a negative object. Um, it is one or the other. And um, so these things, um, this is the record for the Stern camera, uh, a detective camera that you wore under your waistcoat. And in actual fact, the photograph of the Stern camera, aside from having the fingers in it and the wrong number, um, <laughs> has a kind of weird photograph of this object, which is the Stern camera. But what you can mostly see is um, a very strange choice of a display of some positives from the negative that actually sits inside this Stern camera. So photographs and their correspondence to objects in collections have always been a problem analog, and they are a problem digitally. And I think it's one of those things that um, have been, is, are interesting because it shows that there is a mismatch, that photography does something else. However, now as part of cataloging, as part of the protocol, photographing things has become um, accepted, if not recommended, practice. If you go into the Science Museum and you look in their database for photographs, you will find everything in the Science Museum. Everything in the Science Museum is a photograph. It has all been photographed. So you cannot find a photograph and a moon lander. You can find photographs of everything. Um, uh, so if you're looking for photographs in specifically, it's very difficult if you don't want reproductions of the items in the, uh, in the Science Museum. So, I won't go on about catalogs. I have talked about them um, quite a lot. I just want to return to this notion that the idea of using photographs for um, access is not new. Um, it happen, has happened analog and it will happen, continue to happen digitally. It's a matter of how we think about photographs, not as being um, innocent passive items, but the fact that a photograph is a process. It is a practice. It has its own idiosyncrasies. It has its own history, even when we are doing what they once called photographs, slavish copies. Uh, we are photographing. That is, we are making new objects. A photograph of a stern camera is not a stern camera. Um, and a photograph of a photograph is not the original photograph. Um, so we are, in fact, multiplying the photographic archive by tens and millions and millions. So we count the numbers of objects, but we don't count all the copies of those objects as separate items. They seem to tag along, again, in groups. This is what I mean when I talk about the view from everywhere. Photography is insinuating itself into museums. Um, I had one curator once say, well, I thought I had a collection of, I forget what it was, um, it was objects. And actually, I have a photographic collection, only I don't know anything about photographs. Because most of my collection is not objects, it's actually the photographs of the objects. And the photographs of the objects in situ and the provenance photographs, and the conservation photographs. So now I'm curating photographs when I thought I was going to be curating objects. And that is what is happening. It has become actually the view by which we access all of our history. Um, photography has indeed become the way that we view everywhere. Thank you. I think it's good to have all those historians up there for this question, which I've been dying to ask. Um, I think it's a, it's a question about the um, implications of digital. And it was many years ago a student, I asked students at the end of a, a course um, if they had an analog camera, if they had a digital camera, and if they had both, when did they use which? And I remember this one young fellow, whose name I can't recall, saying, I use my analog camera when I want to remember something. I use my digital camera when I want to heighten the experience of the present. And it's haunted me. Um, and it strikes me that this notion of heightening the experience of the present, and when you go into a restaurant and everybody's photographing their food and sending it to somebody else and then they erase it. And I'm wondering whether digital is moving us 
towards an ever-present present. That um, in the same way that I think photography had a lot to do with the rise of history um, in the 19th century where it made the past and progress visible. And I wonder if we, you know, it's the really big picture up there, but I mean, from an archival point of view, it's gonna become increasingly difficult to keep that mass of digital imagery. And so are we going to move into a new sort of mindset where we are in a more ever-present present and the past is less palpably part of our present and the future is quite different. We talk about aspiring to the future and I just, I think that it's a, it's something in here. It, 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 you, it, I'm trying to put my fingers on it and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Um, do I have to? No. Um, my own sense is that all we will have to give up is the notion that photo photography is going to get us out of the bind, that we will have everything. <laughs> um, once, we, once we give that notion up, I think we won't be so anxious about it because we've lost a lot of stuff over history. It hasn't stopped us from doing history. Um, and I think we will continue to lose a lot of stuff. The, and the more images that get made, the higher a number of images, but maybe not the higher percentage of images, will get lost. I think if we think about the, the total loss of image material over time, and we all know this as historians, we go in, archives are incomplete, and they should be incomplete. I mean, we can't keep everything. You end up with Borges and the, you know, the map of the world that corresponds to the world one-to-one. -one. We can't do it. And as soon as, the, the sooner we come to that realization, I think the easier it will be to conceive of what we keep, how we edit that, and um, uh, being comfortable with the fact that we are only keeping part of it and that that choice will just have to go forward in the future as part of history too, as, an, as a historical accident. We, and we deal with historical accidents a lot. Um, mediev medieval historian friends of mine are very, uh, are very happy with this. And they say, I would never get into the 19th century. There's just way too much stuff. I couldn't cope. I couldn't do the kind of history telling. Uh, that I do if I had to actually go through all the material you guys have and I can't conceive of moving into the 21st century because I just find it it's way too much stuff um, so I, I think we will lose a lot um, and I but I think some stuff will get saved in one way or another and we will then get used to dealing with that um, I don't think everything will get lost I, I think you raise I think you raise a really, really important question about a historical tipping point that we haven't talked about in these last two days. We have not really talked about um, how personal collections of digital images might become archives. And I'm sure I'm not alone here in saying that that part of my personal family life that exists in photographic albums is going to survive much longer than that part of my personal life which exists on my iPhone. Uh, there's a certain age after which I would be hard pressed to find the photographs of my children. Before that age, when I was you know, making photographs and putting them in albums, I have it. So I, I think we need to think about that. And I think um, as we think about the future of archives, I think this point may become increasingly important. There's going to be a moment for which our records simply are not as good. I'm not even getting into the issue of how stable digital records are, or especially the way uh, private individuals are saving their digital, digital images. Um, but just as the transition to email means that historians are going to lose an incredible amount of historical data, I think the transition to personally documenting your life with digital pictures is going to mark a similar transition, and it may take us a while to really understand what we've lost. Um, I sort of have, I, can, I think you can hear, can you hear me. Um, I have a couple of thoughts on that because um, I think that uh, it's a very important question, but I also think that we have to be careful about assuming that history, that there's, you know, the, I mean, history is, um, these are stories. We're always, whether we're telling them with visual images or not, we're talking about historical narratives that are um, persuasive to some, that are erased, that are contested. These are all contested histories, whether they're in visual form or not. And I think we have a, a, a more general um, a situation on our hands where we have a, 
a loss of interest in, in history. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I said that the history majors, you, you know, the history departments across the, the country may do with, uh, you know, are interested. But on the other hand, I don't think it's, um, I, I think that there is, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I, I, I think that there's, um, uh, I'm not sure that the, that the, the only issue there is, is this, um, you know, the, the format in which images come or what form the no, you know, knowledge comes. I don't think that's what you're saying, but, um, but, but histories, historical narratives are contested. So if we think about, there was a museum in, um, in Baltimore that noted during the, um, you know, the, the um, protest movements around Black Lives Matter, for example, that they didn't have photographs of social unrest in Baltimore in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. In the analog years, they just didn't have that. Um, and one of the things they realized as they were watching demonstrators walk past the museum was that they wanted to collect people's images of their own participation in those demonstrations. So they put out a call, and they did it through social media, and they, they now have an enormous collection of images of people's participation in that social movement. And I think that's a very, I think it's something histori as historians we have to figure out, you know, and, and historians will figure that out. We'll figure out how to understand the past through what's left behind, but we've always done that. I mean, we, 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 we study what the, what's left behind, always knowing that it's going to be very partial, and it's going to reflect a, um, you know, a particular point of view, and that's why I, I, I'm sometimes uncomfortable with the idea of the theme of, you know, the idea, the idea of objectivity. I like the idea of, um, you know, Donna Haraway and some of the feminist scholars have written about situated knowledges, and situated knowledge is a way to think about how one might have a more robust objectivity through an awareness of what object, subject, they actually have better objectivity when, you ha when you're aware of what subjectivities go into it, and that may be a way to think, uh, to be, um, you know, kind of, um, uh, um, you know, uh, um, to think to think about what's you know what the future of history is going to look like, um, and we don't really know. Just like we didn't know what people didn't know when they put the golden record together, who was gonna if anybody was gonna see it. Um, that's kind of the situation we're in. <laughs> So, as a former historian, in, in the year 2000, uh, I was working in Washington, D.C., and the U.S. Senate had a problem, or an issue, question. How do we preserve the records of the actions of the Senate? And the, the, at we, it, for, for a long time, paper was how we preserved. And, but then technology began to raise all sorts of questions. First of all, the paper wasn't as good anymore, but now do we take pictures of it? We microfiche, then we went to CDs. Then the issue was somebody brought to our attention all this, there won't even be a, a CD player. Um, mm -hmm. and, we, and we have to have these records. I think objectively, because people want to know what the vote was, what the language of the statute was. And we had a determination that we would sort of go back to microfiche in a way, because it seemed as if this was 15, only 15 years ago that at least everyone had a microfiche reader somewhere. <laughs> now, mm -hmm. I, don't, I think there are probably people who have never heard that word before. I don't know. Um, but I think that we still have the, the problem of preserving records that we actually, I think, people think we need. We also have a problem that we don't have a Congress that's doing anything to record. <laughs> I'm not, not going to get into that because we have different, but, but the point is we still have to have the records. Right. And it's not like we can't pick and choose. We have to have every single record. Um, and now I realize, listening to this, that we are keeping those records by making photographs of them. Right. I mean, well, I think this is a very, it's an excellent point because we were talking about the preservation of photographs as objects, but one of the things we haven't talked as much in which, about, in which is, um, and Estelle, um, uh, 
Lea Blas has worked on the history of microfilm, which is such an important topic, you know, and it's a fascinating study um, uh, that she's doing, and, and just to think about the, the role that photography and these reproductive technologies have, have, have the role, the, 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 the way that they've created these archives and archives of written, written documents and the reproducibility, and what is that reproducibility meant that people could witness the same, you know, the same kind of object. So I don't, I don't have anything else to add to that, just that that is a, a really critical, um, and, and just in that photograph of the 1873, the wallet, the photo wallet that I showed, I mean, that, that one of the reasons why the London Stereo Company made that photograph was to show people what photography could do, and in that case, the wallet was just a small part of it. It was really the reproduction of the letters that were, were sent over because the colonial courts didn't want to send the originals. They, want, they wouldn't let the, and they were asserting their, their sovereignty to say that they weren't going to let those, those letters go to England. So they made photographic copies of those letters and that has um, changed the way that we practice law and you know, the kind of system of knowledge itself. So. As someone who's really interested in photographic materiality and how things deteriorate, I mean, I think you should daguerreotype them all, very permanent. Um, they're very heavy, unfortunately, but you know, there are modern day daguerreotypists who would be happy to do that for you, I'm sure. Um, no, in, I mean, in all seriousness, uh, it, it's always been a problem, um, but no material, I mean, I was really fascinated by these materials that were etched to go into space. So, you know, how do you choose the hardest material and then the, you etch them somehow so that it can't, it isn't a photograph, it was mm -hmm. anything but a photograph because of course those are totally impermanent. They'll never stand up in space. Um, and, and this idea of permanence, you know, complete permanence, has always been something that borders on hysteria in the history of photography. Um, it started very early on, and of course the notion of fixation is very elemental to the whole concept of a photograph anyway, um, because people made a lot of things with light sensitive materials before photography was officially invented. Um, but fixity is somehow part of that definition. But everything has a kind of lifespan. Um, uh, nothing will stay around forever. We know that about everything. Um, paper is not going to last forever, although it's a pretty good bet. Um, <laughs> in in history, paper has lasted the best because it's quite durable. So, uh, uh, and you know that con that continued discussion about materials tells us a lot about the anxieties about what we think the totality of the archive should be, um, and and that tells us a lot about where we are at the moment and what we think about these records and whether or not they they should last forever. I mean, should they last forever? Do we really need to know? Um, uh, but it's a good question. And how do you then make it last, quote unquote, forever? Is a real is a really interesting issue. Hi, I'm that archivist from Oberlin again. Um, I have a uh, training in public history, and I'm glad to see history uh, coming to the fore this afternoon because we've talked about objectivity or lack thereof, but we haven't really talked about witness. Um, and I know there's been a lot of writing about photography as witness, um, and I just part of in the legal system when you're trying to determine whether a person as a witness is reliable or not has to do with understanding whether they have a discerning understanding of reality <laughs> and and whether they are um, whether you can understand where they're coming from and I think we need to understand where the photographs and how they were made how that where they are coming from and um, so Objectivity, I think, needs to be within the context of the subjectivities involved in the makers and the cultures in which they were generated. And I think all of you have been saying that in one way or the other, but I haven't heard anyone talk about witness. Well, I was, you know, I think I was, tr I'm sorry. I was trying to address that point when I talk about how difficult it is for historians to assess um, the utility of particular kinds of photographic records. Um, I think it's particularly hard to assess digital records, but you raise an excellent point. It can be difficult to assess the witness evidence of, of analog records as well. And there's just a huge amount of information you have to have to make those assessments. Um, and I've, I've been so struck this afternoon. Basically, I think what everybody here is saying is we love the original thing. Uh, we, we love the original analog photograph. If it, if it is just there, you can go to it and ask all these questions. But once you describe it, once you photograph it, once you catalog it, you subtly, subtly change 
um, its ability to communicate to you. And I'm, I'm just sitting here puzzling over what all of that means myself. Can I maybe just add to that, that I think partly because we, we do like the, the, these objects, because that's the, those are the subjects we work with. And it would be no different from anybody who was working on, you know, 15th century object. And so, so the question for us about digital is a little bit different than it would be for a current generation of historians. I mean, there are a lot of history students now who are coming out who are interested in, in the study of the present. And they are going to be developing tools and, you know, tools of analysis to approach the born digital images. Um, th that's what they're going to do because they're going to be interested in how those give us insight into um, the world we live in. I mean, you know, 10, 15 years ago, people will be looking back and, and understanding what the self culture of selfies is, is like. And so I think it's just that we don't represent all the different ways that people are studying history. We, we represent, um, you know, we, we, I think that, that uh, you know, um, I don't know. That different, there, there will be um, the, the the questions that people might ask about witnessing are going to be are going to look different. Um, I mean, it seems like a kind of an obvious point in a way, but maybe it's worth saying because we may not be the people working on that material, but they are out there. They, they may be out here. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I would like to talk about another notion that was uh, closely attached to, to photography in the 1870s. Uh, I think as close as objectivity, and this is a democratic, the idea that photography is a democratic media, uh, which was born in this era. And um, there was this idea of uh, that now everybody, for example, can have every artwork. And... Um, this reminds me of the discussion on the digital um, paint pictures, um, which also should allow to have every picture everywhere in the world. And what happened in uh, the late 19th century, at least in the art history, was this establishment of this canon of white male Western art. And this was exported throughout the world. And I'm wondering what's going on today. Um, what are we exporting by our digital archives. Mm. We have the mere force because um, the Western world has, I guess, the most archives and uh, the most photos made in the last hundred years. And what's going on today with this kind of democratic idea and, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and hegemonial uh, forces? Do you want to take it? Oh, sure. Um, I have um, I, my, my, my sense is that the notion that photography was democratic from day one uh, is one of the most dangerous 19th century notions um, to enter photographic history and never leave it. Uh, it's something that's universally said by extremely wealthy, not just sort of middle class, but extraordinarily wealthy men who own everything. Um, and I think you find the same thing today. Everyone who is deeply determined to espouse a fantastic democracy tends to be the ones who also in dictate what that democracy needs to be. Um, uh, photography, like everything else, uh, has a worldview that is not the same as everyone else's worldview. Uh, and, and there are, um, it, you even see it in the beginnings of photography. There, are, there were people in the 18, late 1850s who had never seen a photograph still. And we sort of see that as being impossible um, because we think, well, it was invented a whole 15 years before. Hadn't everyone seen a photograph? Well, no. Um, and there are a lot of people who don't see photographs regularly um, still in the world. And we need to take that into account, that photography is not the way that everyone sees everything. It's the way we sort of see everything. Um, uh, and it is this false notion of the view from everywhere, when in actual fact, it's not. It's a, it's a, it's a sort of a white, middle-class, Western world way of seeing things through photography. Um, I think we need to be very careful of that, um, that notion that of, of it being democratic. I guess I maybe would just, did you want to add this, anything? Um, I mean, I don't really, I haven't really worked on these projects, but I've been interested in a lot of the, the, the projects that are, are going on right now to fund 
um, photo conservation in countries where there um, hasn't really been much photo conservation. And I think that's extremely interesting. I mean, I've, I'm, I've been in um, St. Petersburg and at a conference last year, two years ago, in the Hermitage, where um, there have been some really interesting partnerships between the Mellon and the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art and the um, not only the Hermitage, but the conservation equipment is there, but also, um, you know, many other museums were coming forward with their collections because there was this possibility to conserve it. And I think it's it's very interesting, not only because of the ways in which it allows for some of this material to become more visible, but because of the conversation that it allows to happen about what photography is and what it means. So 10, 15 years, you know, you know even sooner, there are these going to be these um, photography students working on this material that are going to completely change our understanding of what Russian photography is like, and um, so I think. Um, and similarly, and, and you know, and um, friends who've worked worked um, in East African archives, and, and actually a lot of that is on um, some of those. The photographs that people are using are, are social media, and so, and social media plays a really huge and really interesting and important role in some of that. Um, uh, in, in that work, and I'm, I'm also thinking about the ways that Olga Shevchenko, who's a sociologist, is using family, uh, going and talking to people about their family albums, and to, and using those as a way to understand the um, the Soviet past from the perspective of the present. And so these things take on an afterlife, and the afterlife is also interesting. So I think it's a very, I think you're you're point, pointing to a really important uh, question about political economy. Um, that uh, an exchange, and I think it's something that um, is important to think about both in relation to the corpus and the big picture, but also just to think in terms of which where, where, where funding can go in terms of um, and, and new directions can go in terms of um, broadening our view of the the kind of um, diaspora of photography. I guess you could say. So I want to please have everyone thank our panelists because we thank you all. Um, and Costanza would like to say a few words, correct, to close out this? Is that, that's on our program anyway. <laughs> so. Thank you. In fact, it was a um, last question to you or a comment, but uh, um, it can be used as a kind of uh, concluding remark. I was thinking that uh, um, uh, the most of us um, uh, have um, uh, uh, an ethical approach also to photographs and uh, photographic archives and the idea of a kind of mission in uh, preserving and make this uh, material more accessible and uh, um, uh, diffuse more understanding for, for photography and uh, improve uh, visual uh, literacy uh, both in the analog and in the uh, digital world. And in fact, um, um, I was thinking that uh, our mission could be um, to uh, improve the awareness of the non-objectivity of photography, uh, both analog and digital. And this is actually the point. It, it is also the point in using photographs, in using um, uh, uh, instruments like uh, uh, databases. If you, uh, if we are able to um, improve through, I don't know, um, books, uh, exhibitions, conferences, uh, teaching, uh, um, also no, not only uh, among colleagues, but. Uh, maybe also among the wider public, the notion that uh, um, uh, a database is not uh, a repository where you find everything, but you find just a selection, and that you have to interpret this sele selection as done by somebody that can be a cultural institution or a, um, a commercial company with different aims and a different policy. So this would uh, help a lot to uh, understand the photographs, both analog and digital. And so uh, I'm pleased to uh, say to you that the question of uh, um, the objectivity of photography and photographic archives is still open, and we still have something to do. Um, I'm uh, very happy uh, about these two days that were, I think, very, very productive for all of us, and uh, I would like to uh, thank the speakers, uh, the moderators, uh, 
uh, the public, uh, which was very engaged in these uh, days with questions and participation. Uh, and um, actually, I would like to thank Anne Blacksmith and Tracy Schuster for the wonderful collaboration. It was a great project, and I'm so happy that we had uh, the opportunity to work together. Thank you. Thank you.